Welcome to the Net Bible Church YouTube channel. If you haven't done so, please hit the subscribe button and click the bell to be notified of our new uploads. If you'd like more information about the Net Bible Church or how you could donate, please click on the link below. Thank you so much for watching. Hallelujah. We need you more today than yesterday. We want you more today than yesterday. We need a fresh, fresh outpouring of your spirit like on the day of Pentecost. Hallelujah. An undeniable touch of your spirit in our hearts and lives. Holy Spirit, have your way tonight. Have your way in our hearts. Have your way in our minds. Have your way in our souls. Have your way in our flesh. Have your way in this place. Have your way. Oh, praise you, Father. Just lift your voice and praise and We just praise you, Father God. We praise you. We honor you. We glorify you. We thank you. We thank you now and always and forever. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are here, that you promised that you would not leave us, that you would promise that you would be in the midst of us. And we welcome you, Holy Spirit. We welcome all of who you are and all of what you can do and all of what you want to do. All of what the Father has for us. Oh, have your way. Have your way that there will be a radical change. Hallelujah. And let it be in us, Lord God. A radical change in this region. A radical change in your people. That people would hunger and thirst and come before your throne. And ask you, Father God, what they must do. Laying down their lives and asking you, Father God, what they must do. Where they should go. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' precious holy name we pray. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. We so need an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. We so need a fresh touch from heaven in each and every one of our lives and a, gr a great awakening in our hearts, a great awakening in our souls. Amen, hallelujah that we no longer live doing things our way, but we do it his way. Amen. And everybody said, amen, 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 hallelujah. Well, you may go ahead and be seated. Thank God for his holy word. Thank God for his holy word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, we're going to start where we kind of left off on Sunday, just because there was so much more to cover, but... For the sake of time and um, going beyond the direction and the whole un unction and the anointing of the Holy Ghost, <laughs> we stopped where we did, but I just, uh, just am so stirred in these scriptures, amen, and everything that we can possibly get out of them, amen? We, we, never, we should not allow ourselves in our hearts and souls <clears throat> to be in a place or get in a place where we feel like we have to have something new, where we have to have something new, amen. We just have to have more of what we already have, not something new. More revelation, more understanding, more wisdom, more anointing, amen. So we're going to start in Matthew in chapter 16, but tonight I am going to be using the New Living Translation, amen, because of... Um, it has a different, the same scriptures with some words that give it a little different viewpoint, as you will see. Amen. So I'm going to just go ahead and start in 16. Um, we have to see that in the beginning of chapter 16, this is when the leaders, the Pharisees, Sadducees, those that always were trying to test and, and trying to uh, prove and taunt um, Jesus in his life and ministry, they came to him and demanding, demanding a miracle. And so, um, and he also at this time had just got done feeding the thousands of people. And so, um, and uh, so Jesus was warning him about false teaching and about false, uh, um, let me just say, teaching that enables a person to think a certain way. And so he was trying to warn them 
or reprimand them about false teaching and that there was always there was always false teaching and there was always going to be false teaching and that's why he said um he told them watch out he warned them warned them and he's still warning his people today thank god that jesus warns us he says watch out and beware of the yeast of the pharisees and the sadducees of course they didn't understand that and they they decided he was saying this because they hadn't brought any bread because Jesus knew that Jesus knew what they were thinking so he said you have so little faith why are you worried about no food we have got to remember that Jesus said himself why are you worried about having no food we should never ever worry or be concerned about having no food i don't care how much it is Jesus can multiply amen he said, won't you ever understand? Don't you remember the 5,000 I fed with five loaves and basket, baskets of food that were left over? He had more leftovers than he started with. Amen? Don't you remember the 4,000 I fed in the seven, with the seven loaves and the baskets of food left over? So he's trying to remind them how short of memory they have that in just a few days before this, he had fed 5,000 and 4,000 and the women and the children, and he had all these leftovers. And so here they're worrying about food. <laughs> He's like, don't you remember these things? And he said, how could you even think I was talking about food? He said, watch out. Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they thought he was talking about food because they used the word yeast. Yeast is just an element of something that causes it to rise and take over, amen? You put a little, yeast, a little yeast in the bread, and it takes over the whole lump, right? So he was warning them about their teaching and how when they infiltrate with the false teaching, how it'll permeate through everything. And so here he's, uh, he's reprimanding them, and saying, how could you even think I was talking about food? So, again, I say, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. <laughs> and then, uh, they, then at, at last they understood that he was speaking, he wasn't speaking about yeast or bread, but about false teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Why? Because they were thick-skulled, hard-hearted, and they did not understand when Jesus was speaking. You always have to understand when Jesus is saying something, he is speaking spiritually, amen, that we have to understand spiritually what Jesus is saying, amen. Understand what Jesus is trying to say spiritually when he's teaching and preaching. But at last they understood <laughs> that, that he was referring to the teaching, and so in verse 13, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea um, Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Well, they, well, they, they, see, he was asking his disciples as he was with them. And then they replied. Some said John the Baptist, some say Elijah and others, Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. So they're all throwing a, <laughs> he's like, who is the Messiah? So it was like wheel of fortune. They're all got to, they all putting in their two cents on who they thought it was and hoping that somebody got it right. Then he asked them, who do you say I am? So here they all were pitching in ideas. And then Simon said, you are the Messiah. In other words, he's asking them, who's the Messiah? They all, none of them knew. But Peter spoke up and said, you're the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, you're blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you and you did not learn this from any human being. And now I say to you that you are Peter and upon this rock, I will build my church. All the powers and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. So rest assured the gates of hell will not prevail against what God is building. Amen? Because he's building a church. 
And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you lock on earth be, will be locked in heaven, and whatever you open on earth will be opened in heaven. In other words, he's telling them, spiritually speaking, it's not a natural key in a natural door. Remember, because when Jesus is speaking, he's talking about spiritual things. So he's talking about a key which is authority. It's not a physical key. Jesus said, I'm going to give you authority that you can open up the things of heaven into the earth. Amen? You can, you can have authority about what goes on right here on the earth. Amen. Right? And then he sternly warned them not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that he had to go to Jerusalem. And he told them, what would happen to him? So he's just warned him ahead of time. This is something he had talked to them from this time on. He would suffer at the hands of the leaders, the leading priests and teachers of the religious law. He would be killed and he would be raised on the third day. Let me just say, even now, we have religious leaders. Amen? Teachers of the law. They're not teaching freedom in Christ. They're teaching living under the law, amen, and that you have to do something to earn your salvation and do something to keep it. They're living under the law. So he was warning them, keeps warning them against teaching, right? And he said he would, but he was telling them that he, that he would be, suffer at the hands of the leaders and the leading priests and the teachers of the religious law. Even now you can say that many that have called themselves Christian churches that do not teach the, the letter of love, amen, and who you are in Christ, and that we have keys to the kingdom, amen, and that we can stand in faith and believe God for, for the price that Jesus paid for us to have everything, amen, and we can, what the, the good news, the gospel, and what it actually is. There are many that maybe don't even have any hierarchy, religious regulations that you have to do. They just think you can just be free and do whatever you feel and whatever you want in any way and anyhow. That you don't have to be involved in church. You don't have to be involved in the body of Christ. You know, they're, you know you're the, the greasy grace message where people said, you know, because we're saved... We can do anything we want, and God will forgive us. When the basis of the gospel is, and you can see this in, in chapter, even in chapter 2, and chapter 3, all through the book of Acts, even in the epistles, whenever they talk to somebody about God, then they wanted to know how to have a relationship with God or what they must do. They always said, repent. That means turn away from your sin. So how can, if that is the gospel, is to repent and turn away from sin, then how could a teacher come along and say that you can live in any sin you want, that God just accepts everybody the way they are, and that they don't have to repent? That's false teaching that Jesus warned us about. Because it's, uh, it's obvious in the Bible that we must repent of our sin. And then he says, if anybody does sin, they can go to God and ask for forgiveness. Not, well, God's just going to let me live this way. That's false teaching. And so he went on to explain this to them. And, and that he was, going to, um, he was going to be killed. Amen. That he was going to suffer many things under the hands of these guys anti-gospel, anti-good news, and that he, let me just say, he said he would be killed, but foremost, that he would be raised on the third day. We, we can't just focus on the fact that Jesus said, I'm going to suffer and be killed, and Peter stepped up. He took him aside and corrected him. Let me just say, remember, Jesus said that he was going to suffer many things and that he would be killed and that he would be raised on the third day. 
He was going to suffer many things. One. Two, he was going to be killed. Three, he was going to be raised from the dead. Peter must have not been listening because he was thinking about an answer. As soon as he said, here Jesus is telling him all these things about the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the teachers of the law. So they're becoming the bad guys. So Peter's like, oh, these guys, the ones that we should be concerned about the yeast and their bad teaching, and they're going to come and take you, and they're going to kill you? That's all Peter heard. Because he wasn't listening to everything that Jesus said, much like we have in this hour. We'll take the parts that we want to hear, and then we'll leave out the rest. So Peter took him aside and corrected him. Heaven forbid, Lord. Here's Here's Peter. Heaven forbid, Lord, he said, this will, he said, this will never happen to you. Let me just say, he was saying, this will never, he's saying, you will never be raised from the dead. He said, this will never happen to you. Peter was quick to respond and real slow to listen because Jesus said very clearly that on the third day he was going to be raised from the dead. But Peter took him aside and said, this will never happen. And Jesus turned to Peter and said, get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view and not from God's. Jesus was telling Peter that just heard from God and said what God said that Jesus was the Messiah and that God was going to build his church on that revelation and then turns around and says, you're never going to be raised from the dead. See, we can easily say, oh, well, he was just trying to say you're never going to be killed or you're never going to suffer. No, he said, I'm going to suffer and I'm going to die and I'm going to be raised from the dead. And Peter said, this is never going to happen to you. I'm going to stop it. See how he did not have in mind the resurrection. He did not have in mind what God not only can do, but he, he was fully planning and intending on doing, and that was raising Christ, the anointed one from the dead, because it had to happen. There would have been no hope for any of us if Christ, Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of the living God, had not been resurrected from the dead. And Peter, Peter actually said, this will never happen. And Jesus said, Get behind me, Satan. You don't have in mind the things of the kingdom of God. Amen. He says, you are seeing things merely from a human point of view and not from God's. Let me just say where God's point of view comes from. It comes from meditation. We can read the word, we can spend time with God, we can spend time in prayer, but if the meditation of our mind and our thoughts is on earthly, worldly things all day long, it'll never sink in. See, Peter had an idea when he said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God, but he didn't have it in him what God had what God's viewpoint was, what God had intended, what God had planned. It comes from the meditation of our thoughts. What do we think about? Is our, is our mind like a wild stallion all day long, like a ping pong ball, thinking about this thing and that thing and another thing, and I got to do this, I got to take care of this, and I got to take care of them. What do they mean? And what do they say? And I'm going to tell them, and I need to get this, and I need to get that, and I'm tired, and I'm sick, and they said this on the news, and meditation and thinking all day long about the things of this world instead of God's viewpoint. 
What, what does God think about it? What's God say about it? Amen? Amen. What does God say about it? You see something. You think about the word of God. You know, there's a lot of talk about these meetings they're having in Switzerland and all these stuff and that it's a rogue government. If you know what the word of God says and you meditate on these things and you know what it is, you're not afraid of it, you're not concerned about it. It's, it's a new world order government. That's all it is because that's what's coming. It's been around for decades. They're just come out of the closet. When you see the price of food and the price of gas, none of it really matters because God's our provider. It doesn't say God can only provide when the economy is good. We see how he provided for the, for the 5,000 and for the 4,000. And he rebuked the disciples about that. He goes like, you were there when I fed them. How could you forget? How could we forget? How could we forget that God can, God can feed the thousands? Who do you think, who do you, where do you think gas comes from? The earth. It belongs to God. It's all ours. Why are we thinking about the things of the world instead of thinking about from God's point of view? Amen? <laughs> Amen? Then Jesus said to the disciples, if any of you wants to be my followers, we, Jesus is saying this in this hour to the body of Christ, to all of us, all of us, if any of you wants to be my followers, not I'm a Christian because I believe in Jesus, a follower of Christ. He says, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must put aside your selfish ambition. I love the red letter editions because it shows you exactly what Jesus said. All the other letters are things that all the other people said and all the things that happened and all the things that were done, but the red letters say what Jesus said. And he is the word. And he said, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must put aside your selfish ambition because anything that is not towards God and for God is for ourself. And he said, put aside your selfish ambitions. Shoulder your cross and follow me. Hallelujah. God is warning and calling and speaking and moving on the body of Christ to draw a line in the sand who you will follow today. Will you pick up your cross? Will you lay down all your plans and your purposes and your fun and and at, just get with God and find out what he wants you to do. Amen? And what he wants you to keep doing. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. You must put aside your selfish ambition, shoulder your cross, and follow me. So a lot of people are, well, how do you know? And how do you follow Jesus? And you follow the word. You follow the simple things that God asks you to do daily you know, to walk in love and, and to pray and meditate on the word. And as we do those things, you know, I can, I can look back long before I was ever in ministry. I, I mean, I wouldn't be here today. Let me just say, I got a lot of things that God is still working on me, lots of things. But I would not be here today if I hadn't laid down my plans and followed God's plan for my life. And do you think this is my plan? <laughs> Amen. Do you think this is my plan? I've worked at mega ministries. I worked at all. I've worked at two mega ministries. Amen. But it, 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 but it was God that led me there. But it was God that led me out. <laughs> No matter how much I wanted to stay or what I wanted to do, I had to follow God. Amen. Amen. If you try to keep... Is it warm in here or is it me? If you try to keep your life for yourself... See, he, he's, he's reiterating this. He's reiterating it again. 
He says, if any of you wants to be my followers, you must put aside your selfish ambition, shoulder your cross and follow me. And if you try to keep your life for yourself, I'm just going to do what I want to do, how I want to do it, when I want to do it. If you try to keep your life for yourself, you will lose it. You will lose it in the end. We'll lose it. Amen? But if you give up your life for me, you will find true life. Amen? You'll always have tests and trials, but at least you'll have true life during them. And how do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? This is so heartbreaking. So heartbreaking. Many, many, many of God's children that have been gifted by him with talents to glorify him, to praise him, to help others to know him, have sold their soul to the devil for a fleeting moment of fame and fortune. Amen? But just because somebody does not have fame and fortune doesn't mean they haven't sold their soul. You can sell your soul to the devil and have absolutely nothing for it. That means going after the things that are not of God. Going after selfish ambitions. How do you benefit... And how, how do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul in the process? It's a process. Is anything worth more than your soul? This is Jesus telling his disciples, for I, the Son of Man, will come in and glory in the glory of my Father with his angels and will judge all people according to their deeds. And I assure you that some of you standing here right now will not die before you see me, the Son of Man, coming in my kingdom. Let me just say that. He was for referring to the very next paragraph. Because the next paragraph said six days later, six days later, Jesus took Peter and the two brothers, James and John, and led them up to the high mountain as the men watched Jesus' appearance changed so that his face shone like the sun and his clothing became dazzling white. Suddenly Moses and Elijah appeared, began talking to, with Jesus, and Peter blurted out, Lord, this is wonderful. If you want me to, I'll make three shrines, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. <laughs> Jesus just loved Peter. <laughs> Amen. Let me just say, but even as he said, the bright cloud came over them, and the voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved son, and I am fully pleased with him. Listen to him. He said, God, the voice of God. Let me just say, Jesus just got done telling them that I assure you, some of you standing here right now will not die before you see me, the Son of Man, <clears throat> coming in the kingdom. The next chapter, six days later, they were all together and he saw the glory of God with Elijah and Moses. Amen. Peter, James, and John stood there and they saw the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Amen. Jesus is very specific when he speaks. He doesn't say more than he needs to, amen, and he leaves nothing out. How many of us could say one paragraph with so much in it when he said, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must put aside your selfish ambition and shoulder your cross and follow me. In other words, we have to have in mind the things of God. And not only have them in mind, but we've got to follow through with them. We've got to do what God wants us to do when God, when, 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 when God wants us to do it. And how, how, how God wants us to do it. And it doesn't matter why, why, why God wants us to. And when his spirit leads us, the only thing we do is 
follow him. And if there's something else in the way, we lay it down and follow him. There's always going to be things in the way of following after God. But what do we do? We make a decision that we're going to lay down our life and pick up our cross because it's so much better on the other side. Amen. And what good is it? What good is it if we work and toil and strive to try to gain the world, to try to gain something in this life, trying to gain it? But then we lose our soul. It's not worth it. Amen. Jesus is looking for a few good women and a few good men. <laughs> Amen that are going to follow after him. Amen. He wants to have his way in Ventura County, California, starting from the beach and moving inland. Amen. And it's really up to every single individual. It's not up to the group. It's up to individuals because God knows how to gather his people. He knows how to gather those that are laying down their lives. Amen and bring him to a place. Hallelujah. There's nothing impossible for our God. We have to have God's viewpoint on everything. Somebody tells us something, think to yourself right away, what does God have to say about this? Somebody complains. Faith, faith praises. Doubt complains. We got to listen to what we've been saying. And let me just say, nobody has to figure out what we think because eventually it's coming out of our mouths. And so whatever you're meditating on is going to escape out of between your lips. <laughs> and we don't want to have what doubt and belief has to say. Amen. God is so good, God is so good, God is so good, God is so good. I thank you, Father, for your faithfulness. I thank you, Father, for your faithfulness and your long-suffering and for your heart that desires that all men be saved and come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I thank you, Father, for tonight. I thank you for your holy written word. I thank you for the words that Jesus spoke to all those that would desire to follow him, that we need to lay down our selfish ambitions, our whining and our complaining, and we have to pick up our cross. We have to pick up your will, your plan and purpose, and love it. We thank you, Father God, that you move like you've never moved before, in and through your people in this hour, as we walk in the revelation that you give us. In Jesus' name, everybody that agreed said, amen, 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 hallelujah. I'm so, so thrilled <laughs> that God has made sure all these things were written down for us. Could you imagine <clears throat> if Jesus had said these things to his disciples 2,000 years ago, but there was no record of them? And it even says in the Word of God that if all the things that Jesus spoke and all the things that he did and the miracles and the healings that happened in his life ministry, that the world couldn't contain that many books. But I'm glad he gave us this one and that this one is enough. Amen? Sometimes it might seem like too much, but it's not too much. It's just enough. Amen.